that you have conquered the grave and that you are a risen Savior and that we have the hope of salvation through your Son and the hope of, of eternity. Why else would we not be happy in worship today? Because of that promise. Father, I pray that during our time today that we can just strip away the things that are going on in life, the things that are stressing us out, the things that we just can't get off our mind, that just in the next few moments as we just worship you in, in song, and now as we can worship you through your word, let's, let's clear our mind of distractions about what's going on in life. And that we'll take some time and just cling to the hope that you give us. As we talk about your church, the power of one church and what that means for your church here at Kimona Heights Christian Church. Thank you for this day. Thank you for time to share together as church family. It's through your son's name we pray. Amen. You have a seat. Uh, well, good morning over the last... At, over the last uh, three weeks, we've been talking about the idea of the power of one. And for, um, for me, uh, one has always been a powerful number. Uh, I know it's one of the smallest, but it was pretty powerful in my house growing up. Because when I was always doing something wrong, I would always get the countdown. Three, two, one. And when I heard one, it was like, all right, you better stop or consequences are coming. Like, uh, maybe... It was, my mom told me to turn the TV off, and then she comes in 10 minutes later, and she's like, Mark, what is going on? And then she starts the countdown. Or my brother and I are playing football in our room, uh, like we're not supposed to, but she hears one of us uh, thud into the wall, and she says, what is going on? And the countdown begins. Or my brother and I were playing with my sister's cat <laughs> with a clothes basket down the wrong way. And we take it for a ride around the living room. Uh, and I heard Mark, three, two, and it got to zero pretty quick in that moment. But the power of one, we've been talking about the idea of the power of one, and we talked about the power of one prayer. And the impact that that can have in our, our lives and the lives of the people that we love and care about. The power of prayer. One prayer. And we talked about the power of one invitation last week. About someone that God has pressed upon your heart that you, uh, he is desiring for you to invest life in and invite to church in some capacity or invite to your house just to talk or to invite just to share some Bible study or some scripture reading together. And today as we conclude this series, we're going to talk about the power of one church. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we see that Jesus sees the church as something as very important, especially as he's um, eventually going to die, raise, and then go back into heaven. Church is going to be the solid place for his people. And in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, we read this. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Throughout the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as we read in the New Testament, we can see the love and compassion that Jesus had on the people as he walked this earth. As he taught his disciples, as he looked at uh, the people that came in the crowds, the woman that came in the crowded area and taught, touched the hem of his shirt or cloak. And he turned and said, who touched me? We see him with a woman at the well and just not supposed to talk to her, the Samaritan woman at the well. And he breaks down barriers and he says, I just want to show my father's love to you. And on and on we could talk about the grace and the love that Jesus showed as he walked this earth. And for those who understood who he was, he was uh, some understood that he was the Messiah, but it wasn't until the point where he died on the cross that they totally kind of got what happened. 
And then if we continue to read after Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we get into the book of Acts and we see the first century church established. And we see them in Acts 2, meeting together, uh, reading the word of God together, taking care of each other, selling their possessions to take care of one another. And then we see Paul and the other apostles start on their missionary journeys and they continue to set up church after church after church as we can read in the book of Acts. They set up several local churches. And then you can read most of the rest of the New Testament letters and they're from Paul and he's talking about to these churches and encouraging them and warning them of different things. See, the local church, the power of the local church is very evident in the New Testament. Today, as we look at the power of one church, as we look at the power of a local church, I hope that we can look at the insights and things that we get from Scripture and we can apply that to the church that God has established here, Kimwood Heights Christian Church, that many of you are members of that are here today. The first thing, um, if you want to write some things down, the first thing that's on the screen is this. A church loses its full potential when it focuses on itself. A church loses its full potential when it focuses on itself. There's a group of people that God is wanting to talk to in the book of Isaiah. And they're kind of, I'll set it up here, they're, they're wanting to fast and they're fasting and they're not eating and um, they're showing that their love for God and they want to hear from God. And so God um, talks to his people through the prophet Isaiah in chapter 58, verses 1 through 5, and then we'll read a little more after that in a little while. But these people are trying to put on this outward appearance and they're not doing this right. And God kind of talks through Isaiah, kind of tell them what they're doing wrong. And in verse one, it says this, this, shout it aloud. Do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day, they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways. As if they were, they were a nation that does what is right and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me, for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not, and you have not seen it? Why have, you humbled, why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting, you do as you please and exploit all your workers. Your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fist. You cannot fast as you do today and expect, expect your voice to be heard on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen only a day for a man to humble himself? It is, only for, is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and, li and lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? A day acceptable to the Lord. Now those are some pretty um, strict instructions to his people that God is talking to Isaiah, to his people through Isaiah. And here we have a group of people that say they want to know God, they want to hear from God, but they're just doing everything wrong. They, they say they're fasting, but God can't honor their fast because they're quarreling and yelling and doing different things with each other, not treating people the way they should. They're more worried about themselves and the, looking like they're doing what they're supposed to do. Their outward appearance, and they have no care about what they're, how they're treating other people. And here, as we talk about the power of one church, I want us uh, not to say that we're fighting and <laughs> bickering and doing things like that or hitting each other. That's good that we're not doing that. But these guys have kind of just lost their focus. And we must understand that God desires us to keep focus. See, I think sometimes as a church that we can become so focused on what we're doing inside the walls of our church. We can focus on this, what we're doing right now, Sunday morning. It's a great thing. We come and we worship the Lord together and we bring him praise. It's a good thing. We should keep doing it. Uh, we have Bible studies on Wednesdays, on different nights of the week. We have different, a lot of different things that we do, great things that we do. But I think sometimes it becomes uh, just 
Sometimes what we know what is right to do, or we feel like it's the right thing to do, and sometimes we lose our focus, and we don't think about what's outside the walls of our church. We continue to think about what's going on and what's going on for us. Good things going on for us, but sometimes we lose focus about what's going on outside. And this is kind of what's happening in Isaiah here as God's talking to his people, saying you've lost your focus. You're more about worried about yourself and the things that are going on than really honoring me. Today, as we look at this idea of the power of one church, we need to look at our focus And in Rick Russo's book, The Externally Focused Church, he talks about um, when they were getting ready to, not him, but NASA was getting ready to launch the Hubble uh, Space Telescope, which was launched from the shuttle Discovery on April 24th, 1990. This is the biggest telescope ever that was going to be launched, and it was a $1.5 billion project. And it was said that the, uh, the mirror, the glass, was like eight feet across, and it weighed more than one ton for the glass to be the reflector in this telescope. It was perched five, uh, not five, 353 miles above the Earth, and the Hubble had an unobstructed view of everything and a lot of things in our galaxy. It could see many, many light years away. So everybody was excited, it got launched, and it was out in orbit, and the pictures started coming back. And that's when the problem, not started, but they discovered the problem. They discovered that the the glass, the reflector, was off. It was, when they got pictures, they were all fuzzy. So this $1.5 billion project is now just a bunch of fuzzy pictures of outer space that we can't even understand what's going on. So because of the great, enormous amount of uh, time and energy, and we wanted to see what's going on in space, in 1993, they figured out how to go fix the Hubble Space Telescope. So they sent Discover, um, Discovery, the shuttle, back up, and the astronauts uh, went out, and they put, no kidding, corrective lenses on the mirror. So they gave the Hubble Telescope glasses. See... The Hubble telescope, it was huge, it was big, and it was powerful. But the one thing that it lacked was its focus. And when it was, the focus was off, there was, it was useless. And as we talk about the power of one church, the power of the local church, we as a church, we must be focused. And it must not always be on ourselves, but on the saving power of Jesus, not just for ourselves, but for others as well. See, Christ is calling his church to more than just what goes on here during the week. Second thing uh, you might want to write down today is this. The communities we live in are hopeless without the hope of the church. The communities that we live in are hopeless without the hope of the church. See, if we continue to read where God is talking to his, his people through the prophet Isaiah, picking up in verses 6 through 12, it says this, and this, God is saying, this is how I want you to approach me and approach others around you. Is, it not, is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke. To set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to, and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe him. And not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You, you will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, and if you spend, your, if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen you, your frame. 
You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will rise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorers of streets with dwellings. See, God is preparing and he's saying, I want you to be people who look out for the needs of others as well. God is pleading with his uh, people through the prophet Isaiah to approach him with the right attitude and to not worry so much about them, their selves and the things that are going on with them and continue to look out for the needs of those around them. He said, for you to do this right, for the power of one church, you need to not only worry about yourselves, but you need to worry about the needs of others. We've read this next scripture many times, probably in Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. Jesus looks at his disciples, he looks at his followers, and he says, here, this is your mission. This is what you're supposed to do if you're a follower of me. In verse 14, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither, neither do people light a lamp and put it up put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. See, there's, it's interesting that the Greek language here um, can translate the word, words good deeds in two different ways. The first is agathos, which translates a thing of good quality. So good deeds could be a thing of good quality. Well, the other Greek word is kaios, which translates as something that is not only good or of good quality, but it's also something beautiful and attractive. So here in this verse, when it's talking about good deeds... The word translated here is kaleos, which means that when we, as Christ's church, as we are to shine, we are to be something that is of good quality. But not just something of good quality, something that is attractive to other people. Something that brings a, attraction to God and who he is. Where it says, so that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. See, Jesus is telling his followers that the hope of the church, the hope for his people, is they need not to worry so much about their comfort, but to shine in a way to bring glory to him. I really like the message version of this passage where it says, here's another way to put it. You're here to be a light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public, public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand. Shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God the generous Father in heaven. Can you understand the serious power of one church? Can you imagine what our community would look like if all the churches in our community began loving and serving in a meaningful way? If all the followers of Christ would start loving and serving in a meaningful way, what would that look like in our community. If we got out, if we just didn't think about what's going on in here, but we also think about what's going on outside these walls, what would they look like? See, I kind of translate this. This is very loose translation. It's saying we need to get rid of the Motel 6 model of we've got the light on for you. We've got the light on. Just come on in. It's here. Whenever you're ready to come in, come on in. See, and the model that we need to look at outside our walls is we're getting our flashlights and we're getting our lanterns and we're taking the light into our community and just not turning, turning the porch light on. But we're going out showing them the love of Christ. 
Many of you, us in here have heard this phrase, people do, don't know how much you care, how much you know until they know how much you care. And today, as we look at the power of one church, I think we can look at it in the same way of the people in our community may not really care a whole lot about what we know about God or think about God or our relationship with God until they know how much the church cares and loves them and cares for them. See, it's our hope as a church, as one church of Kenwood Heights Christian Church to break the mold in this community and the community around us and to serve them in a way that they know that the church loves them, that God loves them and cares for them. So it's our hope that we can bring the hope of the gospel to our community. This year, some of our outreach goals are to, to look outside our walls. We just finished up a, a great upward basketball season. We have um, our awards night this Friday night, uh, but we had 79 um, kids either cheerleading or playing basketball. And the great thing about that was it wasn't just the basketball. That was secondary to most of us. It was the time in our halftime or our middle of our practice devotionals where we could share the love of Christ with them. And they had their memory verse cards that every week they would come in and tell us their memory verses and what that meant to them and how that applied to them and their lives. We were planting seeds in 79 children. And then on Saturday mornings, they came and played. And then the, also one of our main focuses wasn't, was on the games, but was the eternal impact of when we had people coming in and giving halftime devotions to their parents and their grandparents and their aunts and their uncles. Great outreach event. We hope people um, know that we love them for them. But again, we turned the porch light on and said, come in. We want you here because we do. We want them here whatever way they will come in. But this May, our hope is to go outside our church walls. We've been meeting with some people in our community about needs in our community and ways that we can serve our community, help that is needed. And in May, we're hoping either on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon, we haven't figured all those dynamics out or what's going on or maybe another day, but we want to blanket the city with, with our church. And we want to go out and we want to serve them in whatever capacity that might be. Maybe it's one of your neighbors who has a fence that's fallen and they can't, they can't fix it on their own. Maybe that's something that you say, hey, I know somebody needs help and it would be great if we could show God's love in that way. So over the next few weeks, if you want to come see me or uh, any of the staff or leadership and say, hey, here's some ideas that I have. And we'll look at those and we'll look at the opportunities and then we'll let you know what we're going to be doing. But we've done some things like this. This past Christmas time, you remember, we said we're going to try something different. We're going to go in a different direction because we want to go outside the walls of the church. We didn't have a big Christmas play or um, concert or anything here. But we said uh, we want to partner with South Park Tap School. And we want them to know that those girls are loved and God loves them and cares for them. And you guys did a marvelous job showing God's love through service. I know about a year or so ago, we had, a, um, we had a class here, and it was titled Outlive Your Life. And I know after that class was over, there was five or six people that went to three or four different laundromats in our community. And they just went and showed up and hung, hung out with people uh, just to see what was going on. And they went with a bunch of change, and they said, would you like us to pay for your laundry? And you know what? Some said, no, I've got this. I'm fine. And others said, Oh, I can feed my kids this week because you're doing this for me. And that's, we want to show the love of God outside the walls of this church. So we're, we're looking at needs, we're looking at things, and it's just not something we want to do in May. It's something we want to do and continue to look, look at. And as God's church, we must be in constant prayer about God's direction and what he's asking us as a church, as a local church, the power of one church, in this community. See, God is calling us to change the world, and he's calling us to change our community through him. 
See, it's us being obedient. See, we're ordinary people. God uses ordinary people to do incredible things. You can look all through scripture and see that. We just have to be available and willing to say, I'm willing to go and I'm willing to serve no matter what it is. Let's take a look at what something like that might look like. When we hate the poverty and injustice that God hates, we're moved to change it, to find specific ways to bring the hope found in Jesus to desperate situations. What do you feel when you see a drug addict? What do you think when you drive by a prison? Can you imagine those people are part of a family? Let's take a look now at this unique high school football team. At the Gainesville State School, things are not quite like they are at any other high school campus. Here, the students, ages 13 to 19, are all convicted criminals. Theft, uh, burglary, uh, drugs, quite a few have committed armed robbery or aggravated robbery. Most of the time it's repetitive behavior. And we hope eventually they redirect themselves. Life at this maximum security facility is anything but normal. Yet if these kids achieve in the classroom and meet the school's strict behavior standards, they can play football. The one thing that provides a brief brush with freedom. I seen it as a way that I could have released my energy. And it was a good way to get out that tension on my chest. So I, that's why I picked it up in the first place. But then after a while, it, it really motivated me. The chance of getting to smell that popcorn, the chance of seeing a cheerleader, the chance of hearing these people in the stands yelling and screaming and the bands playing and everything else like a football game, and that's what they look forward to. Yet for the Gainesville boys, every game is an away game. Every crowd, an away crowd. Most with little understanding or compassion. Each experience holds a constant reminder of who they are and what they've done. After suffering through a 2008 season that saw eight consecutive losses, the Tornadoes traveled to Grapevine to finish their season against private school powerhouse Faith Christian. Faith's coach, Chris Hogan, had a game plan for that night that had nothing to do with football. As soon as I knew Gainesville was in our district, I wonder what that's going to be like. I mean, I bet you there's a way to impact them. The outgrowth of that was what would give them the most hope. And so then we had the idea. Hogan sent an email to the entire faith community asking fans, students, and parents to do something completely out of the ordinary. Cheer for Gainesville and make these boys feel like they were their own. So Coach Hogan called me and I'm going, oh yeah, here we go, he's gonna make us a spirit line, yeah, 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 and he's gonna make us a banner, here we go with JV cheerleaders and a little big banner. Well, we get down there and uh, uh, I said, okay, this is gonna be good. And I turn around and look and there's this big long line, this 40 yard line. It surprised me. I couldn't know going, this is way past amazing. I just seen all the people right there, and I was just shocked, surprised. Then when I found out it was a spirit line, they wanted us to run through it. I mean, it just, I don't know, it just, it was just a good feeling to have. The all them people just kind of come out there and support us. I figured we were just going to go around them. I figured it was for the other team. But uh, Coach Williams, he said, uh, run. And I said, mm -mm. they're on the right end. They're here for you. Why are they here for us? I said, don't worry about it. Run through that line crash through that banner and have fun all night long. That's what it's all about. After they made the spirit line, they came and sat on our side. I was thinking, I was like, what are these people doing? For the first time, the boys from Gainesville felt like they were the home team. It's almost like they didn't have to prove anything. There was such a celebration of them they begin to think, yeah, we are a team like everybody else. While the scoreboard showed Gainesville coming up short that night, losing by a score of 33 to 14, it hardly mattered. Just that feeling that we had, you couldn't convince nobody on that team that we lost. I feel like God was just touching upon all of us and letting us know that there's people out there that care about you, even though they don't even know us. That was the first time they ever seen us ever in their life. What we did in our past, they didn't care about that. They just cared that we was there right then and there, and they wanted to love us like their own kids. Their emotional maturity went up several years that night when they saw that there were more people out there that were giving of their heart 
these are the things that makes them feel that they're just as important as any other kid on the face of this earth. It motivated me and gave me a lot of hope. They're willing to help us as long as we're willing to help ourselves. They're willing to give us a second chance as long as we're willing to take the second chance. We could be affirmed in the fact that we really made a difference that night, and I think you can see it's down the road made a difference. Had we done this before, maybe 10 or 12, 15 years ago, had we done things like this, there's a good possibility that this place might not even exist. An amazing example of looking out for the needs of others, looking outside the walls of the church to let others know who may not know who Jesus is, don't really care to know who Jesus is, for them to see how much God loves them. So we have that message. We have that hope. We shouldn't keep that hope and message inside the walls. So it's our hope that we can go outside the walls uh, and you can come up with ideas and that we can be praying and looking at opportunities that we can do that. So the question we should ask ourselves this morning is what can we do as a church to bring the message of the gospel of Jesus to the people around us? May it be our goals to go outside these walls. Many of you, most of you, hopefully all of you, I don't want to knock them down yet. Um, came in today and you got a domino and a lot of you were like, what is this for? Uh, why do we have this? Janie was all perplexed about it, but she handed them out anyway. Um, and so uh, to me, as I was thinking about it, it this domino, domino represents to me the power of one. I'll be honest with you, I don't have a clue how to play dominoes, so we're not playing dominoes today. But I remember every domino set we had in my house growing up is that we made a line and started with one and knocked them all down. And you've seen videos online maybe where somebody set up a ton of them. I really love watching those because that was like one of my dreams to be able to do that one day. But I. I wanted to do this, I wanted to line a bunch all the way around the, the gym today, but uh, Adam wouldn't buy them, so I didn't get them. Uh, but the idea of the power of one, we've been talking about the power of one prayer. Praying for someone, a need that they may have, or just their relationship with their family, or a, a job situation, or an addiction, or, or just something going on in their life that God can transform that and bring them outside of something that's going on in their lives. Or the power of an invitation. The power just to invite someone to church or to invite them to a Bible study or to invite them to lunch just to talk, just to see what's going on. And just a simple invitation, the power of that or the power of one church today that we have talked about. So I just wanted to give you this domino. I want you to take it with you. I, we want it to be as a reminder of the series of kind of the things we've done. Maybe you write the name of the prayer, person you're praying for. Uh, we had sheets out the last couple of weeks where you turned them into the box. Maybe you just write their name on there and it's a reminder of that, of what you can need to continue to pray for. Or maybe you write the place that you want to invite the person of the power of the invitation. Or maybe you write something you want to do outside the walls of this church. And you write that on there and you're kind of scared about it or you're, you don't know if you want to talk to one of us about it or something like that. But you put it on there and you pray about it. You think about it. Or you just put this somewhere where you remind you that the church is just not about a building. The church is us, the people going outside of these walls and letting others know who Christ is. Because with the power of one, through God's spirit and through God's power, the power that the one comes from, we can change many, many lives. Let us pray. Father, we, uh, we just thank you for your word. 
sometimes when we read your word, we like to <laughs> skip over some things because when we're challenged, it takes us outside of our, our comfort zones of saying, really, you wanted me to do that? Uh, well, I know that people in the Bible could do that, but I don't know about me. But Lord, I know that we are we're just ordinary people that serve an amazing God, a powerful God. And I pray for my, myself in my life that I won't be so concerned about what I don't think I can do, but know that I have a God who can. And if you, if you want to do something through me, and I pray that we all have a spirit today to allow you to come and we allow you to to tell us what to do and where to serve and I just pray as we look at ways that we can share the love and message that we have that we hold on to so dear ways that we can share that outside of this building whether it be a service project day in May or maybe it's helping our neighbor tomorrow when it's 70 degrees outside. Whatever it may be, we, may we allow your spirit to move in us. And when we sense that, we just do it. And we are in tune with you. We allow you to move in our lives. Let us be your servants today. So your son's name we pray. Amen. Today, if there's a public decision you need to make, uh, we invite you to do that. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your sev Savior, have never been baptized, never entered that saving relationship with him, we encourage you to do that. Pray about that. Talk with somebody today. Come talk to one of us. Come forward and do that today. Maybe you're just sitting there and you're looking at your domino and thinking, what am I going to write on this later? Do I keep this? What do I do with it? Maybe as you're singing right now, you just, you're singing and you're praying at the same time and say, how can I, how can I share your love? Because it's so precious to me. How do I share that with others? So if there's a public decision you need to make today, will you do that as we stand and as we sing?